right, we are here talking about SEM still. So this is SEM number four, or the fourth lecture. Uh, we're talking about related to scanning electron microscopy. And I'm trying to pick up the new tradition or tradition I've been, I've been trying to do for most of these lectures and have kind of an interesting picture. And uh, this is a moth's eye. And uh, we have the uh, kind of standard um, information that a SEM gives us. So this was taken in 2019 uh, in December. Um, it's a moth and it's pretty cool. You kind of see the cellular structure of the moth's eye. Um, we used our UVD detector. So this is a secondary like image. And uh, so when this image was generated, we were operating at a low vacuum, so we, it was 90 pascals. So we can't use our Everhart Thornley detector, our, our um, kind of scintillator photomultiplier tube device. So you can't really use that in low vacuum. Um, so what happened here was the specimen was hit with an electron beam. Secondary electrons were generated and backscatter electrons were generated as well but we could not detect those secondary electrons directly because we can't use our Everhart Thornley detector. So these secondary electrons interacted with the air, excited the electrons in the air to an upper level and came back down to their natural state or their ground state, if you will, and emitted a photon, conservation of energy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. So something had to happen um, e equals HC over lambda. So we accept that a photon is an energy packet. This photon then hit the UVD detector. And uh, so we get an image generated by a photon that has an energy proportional to the secondary electron that led to the generation of this photon, blowing my mind thinking about it. There's a diagram in the previous lecture that hopefully clears up my words. And uh, so we get this secondary like image. Um, kind of other things, uh, 500 microns is uh, the scale bar here. So we're not too terribly high on the mag, but we still see some amazing uh, features of nature. Um, there's a discussion board topic posted where we uh, are asking you to discuss uh, what energy, or sorry, electron signal uh, created the image and it was of the moth's wing. And I said those scales are electron transparent. So what's happened here uh, with this little geometric type structure here is actually a scale that fell off the moth's wing and ended up on the poor fellow's eye. And uh, I can share some higher mag images with you if you're interested. Uh, we were running the machine at uh, 15 kilovolts of accelerating potential. Um, so you could calculate the wavelength of that using our SEM wavelength equation. Our working distance was 9.1 millimeters. And uh, so we're not at too terribly a high magnification on the original print mag. Um, this 500 micron scale bar should kind of give that away. 500 microns is a half a millimeter. So we're not, you know, pushing the limits of, of this instrument by any means. Um, the original print mag was only 110 X and interesting stuff. Um, I, if I've not said it before, I'll say it now. The uh, scanning electron microscope is is my favorite um, characterization tool. Um, it's it's just so versatile. And uh, this week, um, I'll kind of stop with uh, kind of the nitty gritty information uh, pertaining to an SEM, and uh, we'll talk about some other kind of cool stuff uh, you can do with an SEM if you have the right attachments. And a lot of what defines the capability of a scanning electron microscope are the attachments that you put on it. And up until now, uh, we've talked about detectors. So we've talked about secondary detectors, uh, one being the secondary electron detector, Everhart Thornley. Uh, we've talked about two types of backscattered electron detectors. So one is the Robinson detector. It's a scintillator type device. And the other one is a solid state detector and uh, very similar to the CMOS image sensor on your cell phone um, that people use quite often. 
And the third we talked about was kind of this proprietary UVD detector that I really love. And uh, we get kind of cool images uh, like this. And it's proprietary to Hitachi. Um, back in the day, if you wanted to look at organic samples without gold coating and without a high degree of dehydration, we would use what was called an environmental SCM. And you would have to put in a coupling gas. And I'll, I may, since I've mentioned it, not in this lecture, but in a later lecture, uh, kind of show at least a slide about an environmental SEM. Making uh, this slide, uh, this cartoon, I'm kind of kind of presenting this to kind of show what we've talked about this far in uh, lectures one through three pertaining to scanning electron microscopy. Um, I got the original version of this uh, cartoon from someone else, but it was wrong. And so I've augmented it a little bit and made it correct and added a picture of, uh, of this handsome devil here. Um, you know, if you meet him, you're lucky. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, electron gun is where all the magic begins. And so this electron gun uh, could be a thermionic uh, emitter. It could be a secondary electron, I'm sorry, field emission, excuse me. Three electron gun types, what am I thinking? Field emission, thermionic or shot key. Uh, thermionic's the cheapest, uh, like a light bulb. So this could be thermionic, field emission, or shot key. Uh, the electron is accelerated through uh, this column. This is extremely simplified, by the way. Um, I'm not even showing the different orifices that these electrons travel through. And um, I'm, I'm probably gonna have to put in things I missed um, in terms of you know why the pressure in the column can be different than the pressure in the uh, in the chamber, and I'll verbally tell you now, um, there's actually a bunch of very small orifices in uh, in this column, and usually if we're meeting in person, I pass them around. They're little orifices. They're literally discs with holes in them that the electrons can pass through. Um, however, you can have uh, baffles here and run this part of the gun at a lower pressure. I'm sorry, higher vacuum, yeah, okay. Higher vacuum, lower pressure, higher vacuum. We'll just speak in terms of vacuums. You can run the gun and column at a higher vacuum than you can the chamber. And uh, we talked about UVD on this slide. So the chamber is at a, is at a lower pressure but the column is still at a high vacuum. And that's the only way you can get electrons to go through it. And think about a room, okay? So say you're in a little room and your air conditioner is blowing. If you go, and, and outside the little room's a big giant room. The analogy to the orifices, orify, I think is the proper way to say it, in this column is the doorway. And you go into a bigger room, actually the air is gonna blow out of the little room into the big room, um, so to speak. So the pressure is gonna be higher in this big room than it's gonna be, I'm sorry, in your little room, the pressure is gonna be higher in the little room than it will be in the big room, okay? And it's just reversed, it's vacuum. So the vacuum is gonna be higher in the column than the chamber in most cases. And on the field emission SEM, we have these ion pumps, but they're only in the column, okay? So the pressure, is much, much lower, or the vacuum is much, much higher in the column than it is in the chamber, even on the field emission SEM. And what facilitates that is there's actually these little orifices and there's baffles to keep the pressure, or I'm sorry, I keep saying pressure and I mean vacuum, keep the vacuum higher, the pressure lower in the column than the chamber. So the electrons travel through here, they go through different orifices, they go through actually electron lenses, and we've seen that before and the lens condenses the beam and it gets to this pole piece. And then you have your scanning coils here in the pole piece and the scanning coil is going to raster this electron beam across your specimen. So this is my specimen. And that's uh, so what you get. This is a millisecond in time. Your beam raster is at this location. Um, the secondary electrons, I'm depicting secondary electron detector in this case. Um, I could have easily depicted a, a backscatter detector, but the detector would be here. And uh, we get 156 electrons. So now we're in our SEM with our, our most awesome operator, and uh, we get some contrast. We have an electronic signal. This is one pixel. 
Okay, so 156 electrons, we get a pixel, and it's a little dark, right? It's a little gray. Um, we come again to the second location. Again, get some secondary electrons uh, collected by this detector, and it was a higher amount of electrons, so 288 electrons, so it's brighter. Okay, so it's, it's in terms of contrast, it's lighter, but it's brighter because there's more electrons generating the signal. Um, the process happens again. I'm not going to put numbers, but this has to be fewer electrons, um, more electrons, fewer electrons, almost no electrons. Okay, so we have bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark pixels. As a whole, they make these black and white images. And let me get to the other. Sorry, should have planned this out a little better. We get this black and white type image based on the lightness and darkness of pixels. And we're actually getting more electrons generated from this area, the lighter area than this area. And kind of some edge effect almost happening here if you think about it. Okay, let's go through it. So it rasters over this area, boom, boom, boom. We see a difference in the collected electron distribution, different colored pixels or different contrast pixels. And that's what gives our whole image. Going to kind of shift gears just a little bit and pose a question to you. So we've talked about electron material interaction. We, in the purposes of SEM, we care about the generation of secondary electrons and we care about the generation of backscattered electrons. Um, so the question of the day is, can you reflect electrons? So you remember, electrons have wave particle duality, do they not? I believe they do. And uh, that means that you can reflect electrons. And I'm going to kind of show you this device. And I have one uh, that I use fairly regularly. Um, and it's this. This is a, called the poor man's stem. Um, a, a real stem, a dedicated stem is very expensive. This is, uh, I can't remember, five to, 500 to $1,000. And uh, this is kind of cool. So I have one of these. Uh, my reflector, so to speak, is a and this is this is not really a reflector though i'll show you a case where we actually do reflect electrons in more of the light type sense but you put a thin film specimen here it could be just like a tem specimen and we'll see some tem specimens when we talk about tem they're very small discs uh, they're two to three millimeters in diameter and about uh, 70 nanometers thin or thick, depending on your point of view. Um, you put it in here, you put this cap on it. And so now the electrons can actually go through. They can transmit through your specimen. And what happens here is these transmit electrons all have their own energy. And we have this conductive metal um, that's angled and mine is kind of a copper alloy um, the one they have here i'm assuming it's aluminum and it's very smooth okay it's like a mirror you don't ever want to scratch it or you're done and uh, what happens here is you're generating secondary electrons now and since your surface is perfectly smooth the energy of your secondary electron that's emitted from this reflector and i'm doing air quotes reflector um, is proportional to the transmitted electron. So the contrast you see on your image is dictated uh, by the transmitted electron. And so this is reflection-like. And when we get to the end of the lecture, I'm gonna close it out with an example of more of a reflection mechanism uh, that's like looking in a mirror. It's actually kind of cool. We actually make an electron mirror. And uh, this is really cool. Um, I think I should share an image with you on this. Here's an image um, that we generated using um, this poor man's stem. And it's a thin section of, section of a polymer blend. Um, and it's actually a shape memory polymer blend. And I've, I've, we've written papers, my lab has written papers about this material. We didn't use this poor man's stem image uh, because we got a, a better image off of our dedicated stem. And I'll share with you imaging off of the dedicated stem um, in the next lecture. And uh, but this is still pretty good. You can still see phase contrast between uh, the different uh, polymers that are in this blend. 
Uh, this kind of elongated phase here is, is ABS and uh, the not a lot or kind of not rough looking phase is um, ethylene butylene. And uh, so it's a rubbery, rubbery matrix. And uh, we did, I guess we did this uh, a few years back now, but uh, very exciting stuff. Uh, you can get TEM like imaging off of the SEM. A uh, note that the um, instrument is indicating that we're using the secondary electron signal. And it's because we are. Um, remember that the transmitted beam hits this angled reflector. So what the secondary electron detector essentially detects are secondary electrons generated by this reflector. And if you read the text, it's probably saying it in a more concise and simple way uh, than I am. Uh, so you can pause it if I'm not making any sense, but it's, it's really, really cool. And uh, I have one, so in the future, if you ever want to uh, see this in action, let me know. And I'm happy to uh, do this uh, kind of in-person stuff. Um, image, all right, so the main purpose of this lecture actually, and even though I'll close it out with uh, some electron mirror stuff, um, is X-ray analysis and scanning electron microscopy. And uh, so one of the electron uh, material interactions that is generated when we bombard a specimen with an electron beam is X-rays. And if you recall uh, the generation of X-rays and X-ray diffractometry, you're like, well, yeah, of course, uh, but here, we're not using the generated X-ray beam as our probe, okay? Our electron beams are probe, and what's given off as a signal are generated X-rays, okay? Not diffracted X-rays. So an X-ray diffraction, our signal that we're an analyzing, if you will, is diffracted X-rays. Um, here, this is scanning electron microscopy. One of the things we can analyze is generated x-rays. And so if our specimen is copper and aluminum, we can detect the presence of copper and aluminum, that kind of thing. Kind of different flavors of x-ray analysis in SEM, and let me pointer it up, is a spot scan, line scan, area scan, and mapping. And uh, mapping is a very, very popular uh, particularly if you're looking at new alloys. Um, X-ray mapping a lot of times is used in lieu of optical metallography. Um, I know Bradley's beard is tingling right now when I say that because he knows I'm, I'm talking about him. Um, but anyway, mapping, very powerful tool. Um, X-ray analysis, this type of thing, um, if, if kind of tying it in with X-ray diffractometry, um, if a I, I do consulting sometimes for people doing characterization. And if uh, someone comes to me with a mystery sample, uh, typically the first thing I do is I put it in the SEM and uh, so I can tell what elements it's made out of. So I can get elemental analysis. I then put it on the XRD and it narrows my search um, so that I can tell what compounds these elements have formed. So. Here's something very, very important. A lot of misconception uh, people have about EDS is uh, that you can tell um, what compounds. Well, you can get an idea of what compounds are in a specimen by the presence of the elements, uh, but I can't tell you what compound these elements formed. I could make an educated guess, but X-ray diffraction uh, will tell you what compounds these elements formed, okay? so. If I have a bag of iron and carbon, okay, and I throw this mixture in the SEM, I can tell you, yep, there's iron and carbon there. If you come back and say, hey, is there cementite there? I don't really know. Okay, so I can put that specimen on the XRD um, in the utility that you use to figure out which peaks are what. You can tell it to only search for iron and carbon and that makes things a little quicker. And then you can tell yes or no if there's cementite in uh, your bag or your sample of iron and carbon. Hopefully that's an understandable analogy. And if it's not, let me know. I'll try to find a better one. Um, so anyway, different flavors of X-ray analysis in SEM. Um, X-ray generation, so kind of a refresher from X, uh, XRD. Um, your incoming electron comes in, not maybe at an angle, depending on how things are, are going that day. Um, this is the depiction of what K-level um, X-rays. 
So if I knock out a K-level um, electron from its shell, an upper electron comes to fill in the void, fill in the empty space, if you will. Um, if it's one level higher, it's K alpha, two levels higher, it's K beta. If it's three levels higher, K gamma. gamma. Um, there's even K delta if your atom's big enough, if you recall that from our discussion on X-ray diffraction. Now, if you knock out this electron, this L electron, and the upper electron came from here, and this is a real simplistic model, okay, because there's plurality in the L and the M and yada, yada, yada. But just bear with me in the simplistic model. Um, if your L electrons knocked out and an M or an upper level came to fill this, this uh, empty void in, that's L alpha, beta, gamma, and so forth. M level radiation as well, okay? And we've seen this before. Um, I won't click on this table of wavelengths and energies, um, but there are tables of wavelength and energies. Here is an example of a paper-based um, X-ray energy table. And this is pretty cool. It has these uh, kind of slider bars. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if they actually make these anymore. Um, this one's actually, um, in terms of old reference documents, pretty current because it, it has an email address and a web address. And uh, I've said this before, when I started college and I was a freshman in college, I, uh, we didn't even have email addresses. And uh, maybe I shouldn't admit that on, a, on something I record. Uh, but anyway, um, this is pretty cool because on, on one side you slide it and the black, um, sorry, I have a kind of a mirror image thing going on. You have the black little dot here corresponds with the energy. So this is K alpha, K beta, and then you have the M's here all the way and you can actually go to N and uh, for some elements and you can see there's very few, very few elements, sorry, very few elements that have uh, N, N level radiation or have N level x-rays. So it's, it's, it's kind of cool um, to kind of have something like this where you can visualize it. On the other side, you have the different L level x-rays and there's a bunch of L's. And, and I told you on my diagram, it's pretty simplified uh, because there's a plurality um, with, with M's and N's and I'm sorry, with M and L. And uh, I didn't really depict on that last diagram, but it's, it's pretty much the same principle. It just goes over and over again. Um, why is it important to have a supplemental document like this? And uh, I have a periodic table hanging next to my uh, Hitachi SU3500 that uh, tells you the excitation excitation x-rays or the characteristic x-rays for all the elements. And uh, I kind of posed the question already, why is it important to have um, a separate reference for X-ray energies. Um, as you can see on the next slide, I'll show you um, your machine can actually make a mistake in interpreting which element you're actually detecting in your specimen. And uh, so that's uh, one thing to kind of be aware of if uh, you're doing EDS. All right, so talking about X-ray generation, uh, we know that there's different flavors of tables of uh, wavelengths and energies. Um, that are uh, very helpful to us. And, and why do we want to have kind of a backup document, if you will? And it doesn't have to be a, a printed form. A lot of times the software also has a table uh, built in that kind of tells you the wavelengths and, and energies of your, uh, of your, of your uh, elements that you're looking at. Um, I need to kind of note and take a, take a step back into the history. So there was a gentleman that actually uh, observed the, character, uh, the behavior of characteristic x-rays and uh, that was Mosley. And uh, he found that the wavelength of characteristic X-rays varies in a systematic way with the atomic number Z. And uh, that's very, very important to us. And uh, if you recall that E equals HC over lambda, um, we could very, very easily just say that energy of characteristic X-rays varies in a systematic way uh, with the atomic number Z. And if we look at this plot, and they've plotted e to the one half, okay, here. And uh, this is x-ray energy, okay? So this is the energy of the x-ray. And uh, so e to the one half. So 1.49 kV. And um, this is a little interesting in terms of the graph, but we'll just go with it. So 1.49 kV, um, aluminum K alpha um, corresponds with a bromine L alpha. 
So your instrument could get bromine and aluminum mixed up. And uh, I've done a bit of work with aluminum um, in my day. And sure enough, when you're doing EDS, um, sometimes it, it gets it confused. Um, you can see it real time when it's collecting counts. Sometimes for a while, the machine thinks it's bromine. And uh, later on, it realizes, okay, it's aluminum. And sometimes you just have to go and tell your machine, no, this is aluminum. And this can happen for uh, different overlapping elements. And you can kind of see there's different elemental overlaps here. Uh, Mosley's Law is also really cool. So say I'm looking to characterize some aluminum and I want to know what um, accelerating voltage to run my SEM at. And I don't want to just crank it up to 30 um, every time. And uh, here uh, we see excitation potential uh, plotted against atomic number Z. So this is actually the accelerating voltage of your um, machine uh, plotted against the atomic number Z. So in the olden days, we would run uh, the field emission SEM. We, we don't really run at anything above 20. And so, well, what can I see in terms of K alpha with 20? Well, if I'm limiting, if I'm using uh, the acceleration potential as my limiter, I would draw the line to my K alpha line and then draw down. And so that's uh, roughly element 41. And so I can see up to niobium. Um, so I can see niobium K alpha if I'm running my um, machine with an acceleration potential of 20 kilovolts. Um, say I'm going to look at aluminum now. Aluminum is element number 13. And uh, well, what accelerating voltage would I need? Um, well, I would draw I would draw my line from the atomic number, and I'm guesstimating 13. So this isn't the best graph, but guesstimating 13. Draw it over to the acceleration potential, and that's roughly maybe two or three um, kilovolts. So roughly three kilovolts, I can. Um, detect aluminum. Now you still run into the same problem. So this agrees with the other graph, even though that I think the scale is a little funny. Um, if you look at bromine, bromine's element number 30. So we're going to detect the uh, L radiation uh, from bromine at that same acceleration potential. So we can have agreement between these two graphs. Uh, but Mosley's Law is a very, very interesting machine. Um, so say you can only uh, get up to um, 15 kilovolts which is the uh, acceleration potential of the tabletop SCM. Um, I'm gonna kind of do this by hand. You can actually see a fair amount of elements uh, with 15 kilovolts of potential. Um, what's kind of cool when we do X-ray characterization, uh, we can take advantage of elastic and inelastic interactions. So the generation of X-rays is an elastic process and the generation of backscattered electrons is an inelastic process. And uh, so we can use this hand in hand and we can use a backscattered image um, in conjunction with our um, X-ray maps. So this is an example of X-ray mapping. I showed this earlier in the semester. Um, so we can use a backscattered image in conjunction with our X-ray maps to kind of help characterize our, our uh, material. And uh, this is actually, it's unreferenced. I, I don't know if I got it from somewhere or what, but I'm 99.99% certain this is Dr. Varma's work. Um, the person working on it was either a, a gentleman named Benedict Portillo or um, uh, Brandon, Brendan Vogelveed. And uh, I know Brendan works at um, Halliburton these days. Uh, but anyway, so we can kind of see where the chromium lives. And so the chromium isn't on these uh, kind of big grains. Um, it's kind of dispersed everywhere else. So this is kind of cool. Uh, hafnium is, is with the chromium. Um, the silicon is uh, highly concentrated in these bigger grains and uh, niobium is dispersed kind of throughout. So it's actually kind of kind of cool. There are some spatial problems that you can kind of run into and we've kind of seen that with the bulb of excitation uh, depending on your acceleration potential. And they were running this bad boy at 20 kilovolts. So pretty cool. Um, kind of again showing this kind of bulb of excitation. And I don't, this kind of throws things off because it's kind of counterintuitive because it's saying that um, L line is coming from deeper in the specimen. But anyway, this is what Hitachi's telling us. Uh, but this kind of corresponds with what I'm saying here with spatial resolution. It's because the x-rays aren't coming from like this pinpoint area, okay? And again, they're showing kind of a differentiation 
uh, between K scatter and L scatter uh, with your X rays, and so um, L scatter would then have less spatial um, resolution or lower resolution than K generated X rays. So that's kind of something to think about as well, and maybe a reason to go to a higher um, acceleration potential. Um, but again, you're limited. Um, you can't see every element with uh, at K uh, with the acceleration potentials of a SEM. And so that uh, field emission SEM, uh, we typically don't run it higher than 20. Thermionic, we run it at 30. We can run up to 30. Um, X-ray detectors. So let's talk a little bit about the detectors. Uh, they're typically a solid state device. And uh, so a silly detector or a solid state PN junction. And uh, these detectors must be cooled. And so silly is actually uh, cooled by liquid nitrogen. So if you see a scope with a big liquid nitrogen tank on it, that probably is a good sign that you're using a silly detector uh, for your X-ray detector. Um, in the past, you had to cool it 24 seven or the uh, lithium would diffuse out of the silicon. Uh, but the way they make these detectors has changed and I don't wanna go too much into the fabrication process. Um, solid state diode or a PN junction is, 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 uh, gets, um, is less hot and we'll kind of see why. And uh, that's cooled by a Peltier device. And a Peltier device is like what you find in a wine fridge. Uh, you don't have to get as cool with a, with a, on a wine fridge as you do a, like a refrigerator. So you can use a Peltier device uh, versus uh, actual compressor uh, that uses Freon or whatever. Um, that's a refrigerator. Uh, X-ray detectors, we're not dealing with a compressor and Freon. We're dealing either with uh, liquid nitrogen or a Peltier device. I was kind of using an analogy of uh, refrigerators. Um, so here's my painstakingly drawn PowerPoint representation of a silly detector. It's essentially a diode and uh, you have these gold electrodes. And my depiction's a little bit different than the one uh, provided by uh, Hitachi. Uh, but you have a gold electrode in the mix somewhere. And I'm gonna go with uh, the Hitachi schematic being a little bit better than mine. Um, but I have an X-ray going through a beryllium window. Beryllium's very light. Um, I'm gonna show a supplemental video of a gentleman who made an electron gun out of a light bulb. And he used a silicon nitride window, uh, but he was actually passing electrons through it, which was really, really kind of cool. And uh, I'll share that video with with uh, with y'all. Um, so this is uh, kind of true, and I'll show you. I think a more correct schematic than my painstakingly drawn PowerPoint schematic, but the text is right on. So the X-ray causes an ionization process in the silly detector. Um, that process leads to the flow of a, basically a characteristic electric current, and that's based on the Z number. And it's actually based on the X radiation number. So I'm kind of correct there, uh, which can lead to elemental analysis. Um, if you look at this Hitachi uh, provided schematic, it's a little bit more technically correct than mine. And uh, so you have this X-ray, um, it hits this electrode, um, you, you emit an electron and it kind of goes through this material here, passes through the silicon uh, lithium and hits this end layer. So this is kind of a PM junction, but not really. And then you have your gold electrode on this side. So you're hitting a metal with an electron. You then have a bias uh, between these two electrodes. And so your um, electron passes through this detector hits this electrode, you have an electronic signal, it's this pulse current, it's an electronic signal. It's a weak signal, so you have to go through these amplifiers, okay? So then you have an electronic signal processing and that's how you start getting your spectra. One thing I wanna point out here um, is your voltage is pretty high. And so that kinda tells you, they say your bias voltage is 500 to 100 volts. Well, if your high voltage uh, that means you have pretty much no current because this is essentially a PN junction running in reverse bias. Uh, when you run a PN junction in reverse bias, it's hot. And so that's one of the reasons you need to cool these things with liquid nitrogen. And you have 
Um, not quite a PN junction like we're talking about as a semiconductor device, but it's pretty close, okay? And it gets hot, and it gets hotter uh, than uh, your solid or your semiconductor like Peltier, sorry, Peltier cooled device. And we'll see that example later. I'm kind of going over a little review. So if you had electronic materials with me in 2020, uh, you dealt with me drawing stuff on a piece of paper using my child's camera uh, to kind of try to film it and it got a little blurry, uh, but kind of a refresher, a PN junction, uh, you have this depletion zone and it's also called a metallurgical junction in the olden days. Um, so here I'm kind of depicting an arsenic or phosphorus uh, type of material, and that's not necessarily the case here. Um, but the depletion region is. And so if you run in forward bias, your channel widens and you have high current and you can do that with a low voltage and your channel's wide. So more electrons are going to pass through at a given time. So there's a higher cross-sectional area filled with a bunch of electrons. So you have essentially a higher current density. Since the channel's wide, they don't have that much trouble getting through. So forward bias in terms of device is a cooler thing temperature wise, okay? Um, if we look at reverse bias, your channel is actually shrinking and we're at a really low current and this is actually doing it some favors. You're actually pretty close to zero current when you're in reverse bias, okay? And, uh, but what happens here now is you have kind of this thermally react, thermally um, driven electron hole pair interactions in your depletion region, your so-called depletion region is growing, okay? But you're really, really low current. So I bet you're asking yourself a question, okay? So if, if, if forward bias is cool and reverse bias is hot, Okay, well, why do we do it? Because if we're running a reverse bias, we have to cool our device in some way. We have to either use liquid nitrogen with a silly detector, or we have to use a Peltier device uh, with our solid state detector. So you're asking yourself this question, why reverse bias? Why did um, the, the Texans trade DeAndre Hopkins? I, I don't know. We, these are questions that, that we don't know the answer to. Well, actually, I do know the answer to why reverse bias. And... The answer to reverse bias is simple. So in reverse bias, the current is effectively zero. Hopefully I'm not cutting this off with my face. Um, that means only electrons through, the, the only electrons flowing through the detector are the result of electrode, uh, the electrode being hit by an X-ray, okay? So we have this gold electrode here, right? The work function of gold is 5.45 electron volts. Well, the, our emitted x-rays are on the order of kill electron volts. So we're going to generate an electron when we hit that gold with an x-ray. The only electron signal we're going to get is um, based on the emission of these electrons by the electrode or our solid state device. And we'll see another version later. You have to cool it because it's getting hot. You don't want phonons to mess up things, basically. That's why reverse bias answers this question. Why they traded DeAndre Hopkins, I don't know. Um, here's a solid state device, and uh, this is a, a silicon drift detector. And uh, this is what I have on the 3500. The TM1000 tabletop also has a, a silicon drift detector. So we have this P type and N type material, and uh, then we have SiO2 in a metal, and then we kind of have this anode here. Well, the, this two is run in reverse bias. We have a PN junction. So again, it's, it's virtually no current um, due to the, the bias, but we're actually running at a, at a reasonably high voltage. Um, this is kind of a large window. And so for these SDD detectors, the bigger the window, uh, the faster your collection is going to be because the more x-rays are going to collect. So I have a reasonably big window on my machine, and I'll show you which window I have. Um, what happens is you, you cause an electron to be um, emitted here. It drifts. That's why it's called silicon drift detector. It drifts from some part of the detector to this anode. And spatially, it doesn't really matter. It, it'll get there eventually. It'll drift there. That's why it's called a silicon drift detector. Doesn't get as hot as a silly detector, so we can use a Peltier device. Still gets hot due to the reverse bias condition. That's why we're running a reverse bias, solid state PN junction here, 
we want it that way because we want the only electro or sorry electronic signal we generate to be generated by the x-ray that's our reverse bias um, how do we know if we have a good detector well the standard is the full width half maximum of your magnesium k alpha peak why that's the standard i i can't honestly tell you that i know that okay but that's the standard um, this company oxford offers uh, different window sizes so 80 is the biggest and most expensive 20 is the smallest and cheapest so i have 50. it's still pretty good it's mid-range okay i'm frugal um, but still full width half maximum across all their windows is 125 uh, electron volts um, the thinner your peak the higher resolution your detector has okay so if you have anything bigger than 125 it's pretty bad Okay, so if you're buying an, an x-ray detector, always ask your vendor, what's the peak width at full width half maximum of, ma of um, it's not magnesium, manganese. What am I thinking? At least I caught myself without editing. Manganese, excuse me, manganese K-alpha. And I hope I, I, I didn't say magnesium at the beginning, but I probably did. It's manganese, excuse me. It's right in front of my face, man, sorry. Um, anywho, Full width half maximum of your uh, manganese K alpha peak it tells you if you have a good detector. Um, if it's really, really broad, that's bad. I hold to the about the 150 range to be good, okay? Uh, spot scan, so different modes of scanning. Uh, this is an example of spot scan. And so this was a tin bismuth solder. And uh, so we can see the bismuth rich phase and the tin rich phase. Um, a lot of the contrast isn't driven by backscatter. I've shown you examples of a similar material system and we see the contrast driven by backscatter. We actually over etched it so we get some topography and the etch attacked uh, the, bis or the tin rich phase. So there's still some bismuth in it, uh, but there's a lot of tin in it. Okay, so this is the tin rich phase. Um, when you're looking at backscatter signal and you have a bunch of elements, if you have a compound, uh, the average, okay, so the average atomic uh, mass will be the driver of contrast. And so if I have 50% tungsten and 50% um, aluminum, okay, that's going to be brighter than 50% aluminum, 50% copper. Okay, so the average of the two uh, Zs uh, drives contrast and backscatter. If I have multiple elements, that is, okay. Um, Anyway, so this is a spot scan. So we scanned here on this phase and we scanned here on this phase to kind of tell chemically the difference, basically. Um, a line scan, so I kind of made one up. You see line scans a lot when you're doing stacks of thin films and I didn't have a good example. Um, I, I should probably strive to find a better example. Uh, but if I drew this line here and I get bismuth peaks everywhere, I saw bismuth, basically. A mapping, we saw an example of mapping um, I really uh, admire a lot of, uh, especially the, the older works of Varma, uh, basically. He did a lot of good work um, looking for uh, materials that would actually grow passivating oxides. And uh, you can uh, look at this um, article if you're so interested. Uh, pest oxidation is a, is a big problem, and that's kind of what you're seeing here. Uh, but x-ray mapping, again, uh, using uh, elemental mapping in conjunction with a backscatter uh, image to, uh, to kind of characterize your material. There is another type of x-ray detector. So we talked pretty much about EDS. How do we know we have a good EDS detector, yada, yada, yada. Um, there's another type of x-ray detector. It's wavelength dispersive spectroscopy or WDS. Um, I don't like EDX with the letter X. It's energy dispersive spectroscopy. It's EDS, not X, okay? Um, this works on Bragg's Law. It's a mechanical system is very similar to the monochromator detector in the OES. You have moving parts and stuff. And uh, so pseudo crystal diffraction grading filters the x-rays. Um, this might be an old statement. So in the old days, you had different types of crystals and you had to run your analysis multiple times. You could change out your diffraction grading. This may be an old statement. I've not done enough research on a WDS to tell you otherwise. I've not personally gone to buy one. They are more expensive than an EDS. 
and uh, but there and they take a little bit longer to run the scan or at least the older ones did uh, but there are some advantages that a WDS has over an EDS um, it's a mechanical system and so the whole time you're de you're detecting x-rays so there's not this conversion of an x-ray um, to an electronic signal so to speak the x-ray in the detector is an x-ray the whole time um, until you reach something similar to the EDS to tell you um, the wavelength. Oh, no, excuse me, explaining it wrong. It's purely a detection system because the Bragg angle tells you what wavelength it is, excuse me. So there's no energy loss here, okay? Um, here's kind of, you've, you've kind of seen something similar. It's a WDX goiniometer. Hopefully I'm explaining it well. No energy loss, it's an X-ray the entire time in the system. Um, if you get a signal with the specific Bragg angle, okay, that's how you tell what element you're looking at. So your X-ray is not going through these kind of energy conversion processes that you see here on an SCT or, an, um, or a silly detector, okay? It's an X-ray the entire time. Excuse me, I was kind of almost incorrect. Um, so that tells you uh, or gives you the advantages that a WDS has over an EDS. Uh, the disadvantages are they're more expensive. And, um, and let me actually get to the real advantages before I brush it off. Uh, but the disadvantages are they're more expensive and generally they take longer to run their scan uh, than an EDS. Um, and they're also bigger. Okay, so this is an EDS. Uh, this, is a ED, uh, so this is a WDS. This is an EDS and they're on the same system. Well, why would you have them on the same system? Well, uh, these takes a little bit longer to run your scan and I don't have actual times, but I'll just tell you it takes longer. You also have an EDS. So I wanna do my quick scan. I wanna get my more precise scan. E, uh, WDS gives you higher, uh, you can, can detect elements that are at a lower PPM and it also gives you better spatial uh, resolution. So. It's a little blurry, I'm sorry. I got this from Bruker. Um, uh, and it makes sense that they would make WDSs uh, because they also make X-ray diffractometers and a WDS is very similar in principle to an X-ray diffractometer. Um, this is an EDS spectra, the blue line, and the red lines are WDS spectra, so much higher resolution. And I talked about this um, you know, 125 um, peak width you know, for, for, uh, for manganese K alpha. When you look at these peak widths, okay, so this is 50 peak width here, but you're actually seeing, so 50 distance. Okay, it's not the peak width, it's 50. And you're seeing two peaks within 50. So this is a peak width of, I don't know, maybe 10. Okay, so the peak width of the peaks you see on a WDS are much better than an EDS. If I had the means, I would buy a WDS, I really would. Um, much higher resolution you can see a smaller PPM of elements. So it actually is a superior um, X-ray characterization uh, instrument, basically, WDS. So if you have the means, buy a WDS over an EDS. Um, that's my you know, two cents, if you will. All right, so we're taking a look here at the Kanaya and Okaima, Okaima probably, Kanaya and Okaima, excuse me, approximation. Um, I oftentimes kind of berate this equation a little bit, but it's a pretty good approximation and we'll see it worked out here in a, in a second. Um, so the depth of penetration R um, in microns is given by this equation. So 0.027 A E to the 1.7 uh, divided by Z to the 0.89 over density. And uh, these numbers I oftentimes envision, I'm assuming these are two researchers um, I've actually not looked into the history of this that much, so maybe I should. But I kind of envision uh, these two individuals arguing over these coefficients, you know, like, no, it has to be 1.7, but I want to go 1.8. Anyway, um, the units do not cancel, so there's no point in doing a dimensional analysis on this one. However, when you plug in the numbers, uh, the numbers you use have to be in uh, these units here. So Z is atomic number, which of course is unitless. Um, it's raised to the 0.89. Uh, density has to be in grams per centimeters cubed. Um, A, the atomic weight, 
and I'm using bad terminology. I know uh, diehard chemists are just shuddering. It should be atomic mass. Um, I, I, I'm one of those who uses it interchangeably, incorrectly, um, I may add. Uh, but A, atomic weight in grams per mole, and uh, E is the accelerating voltage in kilovolts. So if you're operating uh, your microscope at uh, 10 kilovolts, um, you just plug in 10 here uh, for E. Um, if you're uh, running it at 500 volts, uh, you would then put it uh, enter 0.5. Okay, so kind of bear that in mind if you're given a problem uh, that uses a fraction of a kilovolt. Um, always keep the orders of magnitude in, in, um, in consideration there. So uh, let's work out a couple of uh, versions of this problem. All right, so we're taking a look at a couple of example problems uh, related to depth of penetration uh, using the Kanaya and Okaima approximation. Um, so again, uh, the units don't ever cancel out, but the numbers you uh, plug into this plug and chug equation uh, have to be in uh, the units um, kind of specified here. And, um, and let me try to do my best to highlight it without butchering it. Um, so Z is atomic number. That's, of course, unitless density grams per centimeters cubed. A is atomic weight in grams per mole. And uh, E is accelerating voltage in uh, kilovolts. And you kind of see here, I always have, um, you know, oops, excuse me. I always have, uh, you know, this kind of, ah, that was supposed to be a bracket. Let me let me try better than that. There we go. That's That's pretty good. Um, I always kind of have depth of penetration on the order of microns. And uh, you've seen when we kind of touched upon the Monte Carlo simulation that the depth of penetration uh, depends both on um, uh, greatly on atomic number and um, the uh, accelerating voltage here. So let me kind of undo those so we can look at the equation later. Uh, so the two elements uh, will kind of play around with it. And it's always good to kind of kind of work numbers uh, when you have equations to play around with. Um, so you can kind of kind of understand kind of concepts, right? So this kind of actually ties pretty well, uh, ties in pretty well with Monte Carlo simulation. Um, higher accelerating voltage gets you a greater depth of penetration. A lower Z number decreases your depth of penetration. So we kind of have these two things that we play around with um, in semi-microscopy. So adjusting our accelerating voltage uh, for what we're looking at. In this case, uh, we're just looking at metals. Um, of course, you, uh, you do other adjustments if you're looking at organic specimens, uh, ceramics, what have you. Uh, but we're going to use uh, these two uh, elements here, so aluminum and lead. So if we start with aluminum, and uh, we can use the example of aluminum at, uh, we'll do an accelerating voltage of 10 kilovolts. And uh, so we go back, and it always helps to rewrite the equation uh, so R equals 0 0.027 um, A E to the 1.7 over Z to the 0 0.89 density, so rho. And uh, the units, again, uh, have to be in this kind of gobbledygook I messed up uh, with my highlighter a little bit, but... Density is grams per centimeters cubed, atomic weight grams per mole, and E is the accelerating voltage in kilovolts. So not, not too terribly difficult of an equation. So if we want to do um, aluminum at 10 kilovolts, uh, we would just plug in R equals 0 0.027. Um, A is the atomic weight in grams per mole. So I pulled this off the internet. Um, so I'm going to do uh, 26.98. And if you notice, I'm not writing the units. Um, I already kind of know what they are. Uh, this kind of gives you, but it's understood that it's grams per mole. Okay. And um, what else? E to the 1.7. So we said 10 kilovolts. So accelerating voltage is in kilovolts uh, to the 1.7. Z to the 0.89. So aluminum is 13. And so 13 to the 0 0.89, and then density, it's like 2.7. Yeah, there you go, 2.7 grams per centimeters cubed. 
and let's just kind of work it out. Uh, I have my handy dandy calculator, 0 0.027. Work along if you wish. Uh, 26.98. Um, so I got 36.5 for the top here for the numerator, I believe. And um, I can round up and work along to see if you got similar numbers. And if I've made a mistake, feel free to email me and we'll rectify the situation. Uh, times 13 to the 0.89. And I got 26.47. All right, so 36.51 divided by 26.47, and that's 1.37 microns. And that's pretty cool because I'm in the range of uh, what I kind of depict in my painstakingly drawn PowerPoint uh, diagram of the electron beam slash material interaction. So I'm in, I'm in the range of one micron, so I'm not getting anything uh, too terribly wacky. Um, let's take a look at lead and we can do the same accelerating voltage. So lead at 10 kilovolts, and uh, so R 0 0.027 times uh, lead was 207 point something, I believe, 207.2 uh, grams per mole. And we're saying 10 kilovolts again, so 10 to the 1.7. And let me make that look more like a seven, just in case you're, we'll even put the little, there you go, 10 to the 1.7. And look what I've done. Sorry about that. R equals, okay, that's always important when you're using an equation. Um, the Z number of lead is 82, and then we can go double check, make sure my memory is correct. There you go, 82. And uh, do, 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 do. to the 0 0.89 and times 2.7. No, excuse me, it's the density. I got this number confused with density. How embarrassing. Density is 11.4. My bad. So 11 point, don't, okay, 11.4. See if I can make this as painless as possible. So 0 0.027 times 207.2 times 10 to the 1.7 is a 280, uh, let me just round it, 280.4. Should have some agreement about significant figures. Okay, 82 to the 0.89 times 11.4 is uh, 575.7. And that's going to be very little penetration as compared to aluminum. So 280.4 divided by uh, 575.7, and I got 0.48, and we could round it up to uh, 0 0.49 or even 0 0.5, um, but R equals, and I'm going to write out the digits from my calculator, 0.487, and then we can just kind of round it up, 0 0.5. So here we have half a micron. So we've increased the uh, Z number um, as compared to aluminum pretty considerably. Let me change a different color. So for aluminum, we had a um, low Z number, um, kind of low atomic, atomic mass and a low density here. 
we're, we've kept the accelerating voltage the same. And if we compare to a higher Z number, so for lead here, um, we see that we get far less of a, of a depth of penetration. Um, so let's look at lead again. And uh, so on the scope I tend to use a lot, I have a maximum accelerating voltage of uh, 30 kilovolts. So let's see what happens if, we, if we're looking at lead. Always wanna be careful if you're examining lead. Uh, but let's look at lead again. And now we have an accelerating voltage And this is ramp it up to 30 kilovolts. It's going to be a little higher. So let's see what, how, how uh, deep our electron beam will go into the material if we've uh, maxed out our accelerating voltage. So, and this is an approximation, so theoretically how far it'll go. Um, R equals 0 0.027, uh, again, times 207.2, our atomic mass in grams per mole. And this time we're uh, ramping up to uh, 30 kilovolts and we're gonna put that to the 1.7 power. Again, I laugh. I don't know how much time these individuals put into uh, crafting this equation, um, but you know, one day maybe they were doing 0 0.82 to the 0 0.75 and they discovered that 0 0.89 was the way to go. I don't know, that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, 0. 8, 9, and again, 11.4. So we already know the denominator uh, from uh, our previous problem. So 575.7, so and then let's see how much um, the numerator, or what value our numerator will be, and then our overall uh, theoretical depth of penetration. So 0 0.027 times 207.2 times 30, to the 1.7. And I got 181, uh, 1814.92. So 1814.92, and I could round this to 3. Uh, 1814.93 divided by 75.7, so 3.15 microns. So 3.15 microns. So when we crank it up, we get a much higher uh, theoretical um, depth of penetration. And I kind of know, um, no, never mind. I was going to say something that was incorrect. Okay, so. This kind of drives home, uh, hopefully drives home the effect of, uh, or the interaction, if you will, of accelerating voltage and the material properties, namely uh, the atomic mass. Um, sorry, I'm not doing it in order of highlighting atomic mass, atomic number, and density. And uh, so if we decrease the, the accelerating voltage, um, we get a shorter or lower depth of penetration. If we increase the accelerating voltage, we get a higher depth of penetration. Um, if we look at smaller um, elements, smaller atomic number elements, which then has a lower density and lower atomic mass, uh, we also get a, uh, a lower depth of penetration. And uh, so hopefully uh, this kind of works hand in hand for you all with uh, the kind of uh, Monte Carlo simulation. And uh, hopefully this uh, is a good example of using a somewhat of a nonsensical equation, but it's really just an approximation, um, kind of like uh, some of the approximations we've seen for estimating um, SEM wavelength. Um, anyway, if you have any questions, always feel free to email. Thank you. All right, so kind of revisiting uh, the generation of secondary and backscattered electrons um, we kind of had this cartoon where, uh, you know, we have the incoming electron, there's an inelastically scattered electron, and that becomes your secondary electron. And uh, we then had kind of a similar diagram uh, where we have our incoming electron and uh, we have our elastically scattered electron. So the incoming electron doesn't do anything, doesn't interact with uh, the orbiting atoms and... Um, 
still trying to figure out what atom this is. Um, I don't quite think it's helium, right? It's it's like ionized, weirdly lithium, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, you have this incoming um, electron goes around the nucleus, doesn't hit any of the um, orbiting electrons, makes its way out. Okay, and I kind of show this. This is a really simplified model. Um, I wanted to kind of talk about kind of primary and secondary events. So this would be like a primary event, so-called primary event. And uh, so this would be backscattered electron one, okay, is, is how some texts uh, refer to it as. And this is secondary electron one. And it's not quite that simple. And um, so I kind of have this array of, of three atoms. And uh, so we have um, backscattered electrons, they could kind of take different paths. And I'm sorry, I, I kind of drew it by hand, uh, but we have our incoming electron. Uh, this one's going to go around this nucleus. It doesn't make the full turn and it goes into the neighboring atom and uh, comes around its nucleus and comes out and uh, it's still inelastically scattered. Okay. And uh, so it never interacted with an orbiting electron. So we would kind of call this BSE2. And uh, it could also have gone through more than one atom on its way out. So it went through three atoms. Okay, so we have it going through two atoms and now three atoms. So it comes in, goes around this nucleus, goes through this atom, goes through this atom, then makes a beeline uh, for your backscatter detector. So that's a secondary uh, detector. Um, Sometimes it's hard to visualize that this happens, but it does. And if it didn't happen, you wouldn't be able really to get uh, diffraction patterns and that kind of thing. Um, it is said that this kind of these secondary uh, events, um, and they're not secondary electrons, they're second scattering events are more common. And um, I don't honestly know how, how people know that, but that's what's said. Um, we can kind of look at the same kind of depiction uh, for a secondary electron now. So it comes in to this atom. Uh, at this point, it could be a backscattered electron. It goes into the next atom, but oh, nope, it hit the orbiting electron, knocks it out. It becomes an SE2 electron, so secondary two electron. And uh, we know that this happens because we see edge effect, okay? So uh, uh, coming in from the beam, the electron kind of has to travel to the edge, okay? and be emitted from these second kind of other surfaces and go to the secondary detector. Um, so scattering isn't a, you know, one electron, one atom event. And I didn't want you to leave this class thinking that. Um, anyway, just, just kind of wanted to cover that. Uh, next thing uh, we're going to talk about is uh, um, charging. Um, charging, charging is a big thing. And uh, charging again, electron yield um, is de depicted by um, delta. And <clears throat> I don't talk about this with, with, with really great detail. Basically, if your sample's not grounded, okay, it, it's bad news for imaging. And Hitachi, and I don't even know, maybe other texts like to go through this kind of positive negative charging. And so if delta is greater than one, um, you're positively charging, okay? And so electrons in versus electrons out, okay? So if you have um, more electrons in than electrons going out, they're saying you're positively charged. If you have, if delta is less than one, you're going to have what? You're going to have uh, more electrons going out than going in, you're negatively charged. And so if you're negatively charged, you generally get these clouds um, if you're positively charged, and, and this is interesting. Um, so that's the difference between um, black contrast and white contrast. Black contrast, your specimen's basically a big hole and you don't get any signal at all. And uh, white contrast is clouds. So the, the um, problem is more of when you have uh, more electrons going out than you have coming in. And uh, because the other way you can kind of fix that by increasing your accelerating voltage and kind of changing orientation of your sample and stuff like that. Uh, but the problem where you have more electrons coming out than going in is bad. And uh, so they have uh, examples here of charge up 
and uh, two different examples. One, they can't even get an image at all. Uh, this is supplied by Hitachi. And uh, here you kind of get kind of this glowing. And uh, I, this actually doesn't look that bad to me, these images here. But still, um, they're kind of showing these as examples of, uh, of bad things. Um, all right, three ways uh, to reduce charging. Um, these are my kind of tried and true methods. Uh, method one would be just simply lower uh, your accelerating voltage. Um, so if you're running at 20, you get charge up, try lowering it to 10 or five, or in some machines you can even go to a fraction of a volt and to see if that helps with your, uh, your charge phenomena. On the TM1000, it's a static uh, accelerating voltage of 15 kilovolts, so you can't really do uh, way one or method one. Um, so you could go to method two and you could coach your specimen with a conductor and uh, common conductors are gold, um, a gold palladium alloy. And uh, gold palladium actually has better wetting characteristics than gold alone. Uh, so it's pretty much desirable as a target. Uh, carbon is another carbon common target as well as chromium. And uh, use a VP system if you have one. And uh, a lot of times people don't realize that that TM1000 has the charge suppression mode. And so give it a go, it might actually work. It save you uh, some time in coding. Um, I will tell you, a lot of times people don't like coding their specimens uh, because they think it's going to somehow interfere uh, with their results. And uh, sometimes people do overcoat. And so if you've coded to the point where you can see the film of coding on your specimen, that's a little too much. Uh, the coding is generally on the order of a couple of angstroms. And uh, you really shouldn't get an optical response from your coding um, if you're doing it right. Um, another thing I need to point out is that uh, backscatter electrons, if you have a backscatter detector, it's less susceptible to charge phenomena. And uh, if you look at what they're talking about here, um, I think they said, no, not on this one. On this one, they were talking about, and maybe not even this one, I thought somewhere they were talking about uh, secondary electrons somewhere. Anyway, maybe I just saw it here, but sometimes um, people don't realize that backscatter electrons are not as susceptible to a charge uh, to charging phenomena. Um, kind of sample preparation. Uh, so the FESEM, um, these are just kind of some notes. Uh, they're small, right? So you don't really want them to be two inches uh, in diameter. Uh, the height's determined uh, by a height gauge and it's generally an inch is the limit. So you actually aren't putting giant uh, specimens into the FE sim. Uh, the 3500 and the tabletop, you can actually put bigger um, specimens in it. Uh, so sputtering enhances the image quality. Uh, the sample must be grounded to the specimen stage. And a lot of times people try to do SEM on metallographic specimens that are mounted in resin. And I've seen some people come up with creative ways uh, to kind of come across charge buildup. And uh, they'll put like a piece of copper tape uh, from a little part of their specimen and then wrap it around the plastic and, and put it down onto the sample holder. It's, it's actually kind of cool. Um, I still believe this is true. This is kind of an older slide, but the tabletop SEM, again, this is the uh, charge suppression technology. Uh, so sputtering. So this is an example of me, uh, of my work, and I was not able to resolve uh, some of my stuff. And, and it's very interesting because this was actually a copper silver ink uh, but it was printed on a polymer substrate. And uh, so I could have probably tried the copper tape trick, but I ended up just sputtering my specimen and I got uh, this, this beauty, this beauty here. Again, uh, typical coating materials are an angstrom thick and it really doesn't have a negative impact on analysis if you do it right. Um, here's kind of an example of a, of a magnetron sputter. And uh, so this, this is platinum is one. And uh, so they're actually talking about different targets. So palladium, I kind of talked about palladium a little bit. Um, you have your target, you hit it with an argon ion and it rains down platinum. So it's a physical vapor deposition. I have a sputtering machine that doesn't need argon. Uh, what it actually does is it ionizes air again and these air ions hit the gold target and it actually sputters. It's, it's kind of cool. Um, kind of talking about the kind of UVD, so bleeding air into it again. Um, so this is grounding. So this is the depiction of grounding, uh, specimen coating. Um, in this case, according to the caption, I could also put a piece of copper tape like some people do. 
And so the electro, extra electrons essentially ground. And so you have uh, your delta equals one, basically. So you're not charging. Um, here, this is showing how, and they're showing, they're actually depicting it being used with an uh, older school uh, backscatter electron detector. Uh, but you have your gas in here, and um, it's a non-conductive specimen. So your gas is positively charged, so it sucks off uh, the extra electrons, basically. Uh, so that's what these two uh, Hitachi provided figures are telling us. Um, I kind of want to end this lecture where I began, and I'll pose this question, what do you think this is? And I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it. Um, We've seen this shape before in uh, previous lectures, and uh, it's really kind of neat. And this was a result of super high charge up. And I was running at actually a surprisingly low kilovoltage, but um, I was looking at a, at, a, at a polymer bead, and uh, it caused really, really bad charge up. And I actually got this image, and what it is, is it's actually the backscatter detector. So I was looking, I was using backscatter imaging. It's actually the backscatter detector. And uh, some notes before I forget, um, generally it's running in reverse bias, and uh, but you can also forward bias it. So you can change the bias and uh, repel electrons basically. So that's another thing. But anyway, this picture is this, it's the actual detector. So I effectively charged it up so much that I was making an electron mirror. And so there were so many electrons built up on the specimen, the electrons uh, from the beam basically bounced off the charge and hit the detector, bounced back, and basically showed me an image of the detector. Um, this isn't an unusual thing. So they're all glowing. So that means they're all active, okay? They're all um, biased in a way, they're all energized, if you will. And so some technicians will actually use this as a diagnostic technique to tell them if one of the quadrants is out. Um, this, uh, These folks here at Rochester uh, were really good at making electron mirrors, and they actually got an image of the whole interior chamber of their SEM. Uh, so you can actually see the pole piece, you can see the Everhart Thornley detector, and uh, it's, it's really kind of cool. So it's an electron mirroring process. So to answer the question of the day, you can kind of pseudo reflect electrons and you can actually honestly reflect electrons as well. So pretty cool. Um, this, my friends, is a good place to stop. Hopefully I didn't ramble on too much and uh, hopefully you found this informative. If you have any questions, always feel free to email me. Thank you very much for your time. Oh my. It's the end of the lecture. If you have any questions, you can email me at droberson at utep.edu.